And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged another well. Then a biblical that went to him from Gerar and Abusa, one of his friends, and Pichal, the chief captain of his army, said, and Isaac said, why are you coming to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? And they said, we certainly saw that the Lord was with thee. <laughs> Let there be now an oath between us, even betwixt us and thee, and let there be a covenant made with thee, that you will do us no hurt as we have not touched you, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good. Ain't that like the devil to tell a lie? And I sent thee away in peace. Thou art now the blessed of the Lord. And he, Isaac, made them a feast, and they did eat and drink. And they rose up betimes in the morning and swear one to another. And Isaac sent them away, and they departed in peace. Now watch this. Verse 32, 33 is where we're going to in this reading, and it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had dig, and said unto him, We have found water. And he called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day. Lord, bless your people as we receive your word today. In Jesus' name, amen. On your way down, if you don't mind helping me to bring emphasis to my message tonight. Look at somebody around you and challenge them and say these words. Say, neighbor, neighbor dig, dig another well. But I need to give you a subtopic so all of this will really, really make sense. Would you mind just saying this with me? Say, Rehoboth ain't enough. Rehoboth, let me, let me use my King's English since they're watching me on social media. Rehoboth is not enough. Long past the I'm gonna take my time and walk this all up the hill. If you are or have been in the church world for any length of time, you can identify that the Judeo Christian God, when I say Judeo Christian, it's not me trying to use a big word, but it's relative to the fact that the God that we serve as Christians is the same God that our Jewish brothers and sisters serve as well. He is known as Jehovah, known as Yahweh, Elohim, Adonai, whatever you want to call him, he's the great I am. And so within our respective circles of Judeo-Christian uh, uh, faith and how we operate, all of us can identify in one place that Christians and Jews can connect on apostles is the fact that there is a patriarchy that was set up. Y'all gonna walk with me here tonight? Yes, there was a patriarchy that was set up. Whenever God wanted to identify himself, even in the New Testament, he talked about the fact that he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Come on, y'all got to help me preach in here tonight. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob. So we all know this. We've all heard this. At some point in time, we recognize that he was the God of Abraham. First, we've got Abraham who was uh, called by God. And this messes me up because God called Abraham without any real rhyme or reason. We don't have any real reason to say why God called Abraham aside from the fact that he knew what he put in Abraham from the beginning. Mm. 
Lord, I can shout right there because when we look at Abraham, when we look at Isaac, we look at Jacob, the blessing of it is these men were men of faith, but they were flawed. All right. All right. Mm. They were men of faith, but they were flawed. And sometimes the enemy likes to work on us as believers to try and make us think that God can't use us because we are flawed. I'm not saying live in sin and live unholy, but the fact of the matter is in your walk with God, there's a process called sanctification. Y'all not talking up in here. There's a process called sanctification, which means you got to work out your salvation. From day to day, God is going to work on you and purify you and dig down on the inside of you to get some stuff out that does not belong in you. Because from the day you were born until the day you gave your life to Christ, the enemy was trying to infiltrate your life and put stuff in there that would make you go completely contrary to the ways of God. Am I talking up in here? But I'm so glad that when we gave our life to Jesus, he started the work. And the Bible says in the book of Philippians, he that began a good work. Yeah, God. See, some of us ought to celebrate right there that he that started a good work is going to keep working on you. You were ready to quit. You were ready. Don't take me down too much. You were ready to throw in the towel. But God's grace was enough to keep you and sustain you. And he's going to keep working on you until he gets out of you what he wants from you. Somebody ought to praise him right there. Yeah. Thank you. Aren't you glad you serve the God that specializes? He specializes in taking flawed material and turning it into a masterpiece. Come on. Uh, yes. We, we serve a God who specializes in taking flawed material and turning it into a masterpiece. I know y'all think y'all are better than anybody else. Y'all are wonderful and super deep and super spiritual. But some of us are flawed and God still has taken his time and he's using us to make a masterpiece. Somebody ought to praise him right there. Let me move. Abraham and Jacob were great men. They were great men. But the person that we want to focus on tonight is this man by the name of Isaac. In Genesis 26, he's going to be our topic of conversation tonight. Now let me give you the background of the text because y'all kept seeing me jump every time you turned around tonight because everybody seemed like they were in my sermon. I wanted to throw my shoe up at my little sister because she was in my sermon. But the Bible tells us that around verse number one of chapter 26, just to give you a little background, it tells us that a famine had come in the land. When the famine came in the land, Isaac made a journey. And he goes to a place called Gerar. Somebody say Gerar. Gerar. He goes to Gerar, which means the place of sojourning, the place of traveling, the place of no rest. Y'all will catch that in a minute. The place of no rest. He goes to Gerar, and he's there with a king called Abimelech. Abimelech, now pay attention right here, Abimelech was the king of the Philistines. And while Isaac is there. God speaks to him. And says, Isaac, do not go to Egypt. Stay here. Mm. Mm. He gets to the place where the Philistines are and God says, don't move. Stay here. Now, what did not make sense to me, ladies and gentlemen, is why you know down the road that the Philistines become one of the greatest enemies that the Israelites ever had. Why in the world would God tell him to stay ah, with the Philistines, Lord, have mercy. Uh, I believe, ladies and gentlemen, let me work my way through here. I believe that Isaac likely knew because the custom, the custom, the custom of that day, ladies and gentlemen, the custom was they would the way they passed down 
their history. They didn't have a lot of writing and the ability to do all that writing, so they would pass down their history by telling the story. I believe that Abraham told Isaac about the time that they had to go to Egypt to go during a famine. Uh, when there was a famine going on, Abraham went down to Egypt, and while he was in Egypt, that's, and so I can imagine that was the reason why God probably told Isaac, don't do what your daddy did. It might, okay, let me put it to you like this, that might seem like the easy answer, but the easy answer is not always the right answer. Lord, I wish I had a church right there. I'm talking to somebody in this room. God is trying to tell you that you could take the easy way. He said, but don't take the easy way. The easy way is not the right way. He said, before you make the same move your daddy made, stay here. Come on. Stay here. And I got messed up because one thing I learned, y'all, is God always has a purpose when he tells you what to do. Just because it doesn't make sense to you doesn't mean that God doesn't have a purpose in what he's telling you to do. He tells him, stay right here. I being the type of preacher I am, I've got father. I said, God, I need to understand why in the world you would tell Isaac, your servant, to stay in the land of the Philistines. Everything we know doctrinally and theologically about the Philistines, they represent something bad. Why would you tell him to stay among the Philistines? You know, let me work here. Because see, see, we we love. We love. How many of y'all love suddenly? Yes. We love. So I mean we, we get in church, we start talking about those suddenly. I mean, we start running down aisles, we start dancing, we start shouting, we start hollering, we start screaming. The moment we start talking about suddenly. But I got a question for you tonight. What about when your suddenly does not come in the form you think your suddenly is coming in? Can you, can you see your opposition as a suddenly? Y'all not talking up in here. Can you see your trouble as a suddenly? Can you see your trial as a suddenly? Can you see It became clearer and clearer what God was doing. So y'all gonna walk with me down this journey? Come on. Yes. When Isaac was in the land, God reminded him in verse number two and verse number three, he reminds him of what he told Abraham. He says, I'm gonna bless you. I'm gonna make you to be a blessing. I'm gonna be with you. And he said something very particular. He says, and I'm gonna show you where to go. Yeah. I'm not talking. He said, I'm going to show you where to go. I'm going to show you where to move. I'm going to show you what you're supposed to do. God declared to Isaac in that moment. He said, I know the land is in a famine, but in spite of the famine, I'm still going to bless you. Oh, I wish I had a church right there. I said, God has declared in this house that even if the land is in a famine, I'm still going to bless you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. But there is, see, I got to be a responsible preacher because there was a stipulation. And if. Come on. Come on. You can't get the blessing if you can't be obedient. I'm not talking. Why is it that we expect God to really pour out the major blessings on our life, but we don't want to be obedient? Come on. It's good and quiet in here right about now. 
Ah, uh, yeah, I told you I brought my own amen. We don't want to obey him wholeheartedly. If it's comfortable, we'll obey him. But when it's uncomfortable, we got a question whether we're going to obey him or not. Mm. Come on. <laughs> but let me jump down to verse number 12. I got to hurry up through this thing now. Because now the Bible says in verse number 12, and Isaac did something. Whenever God gives a promise, it requires an investment. Come on. Right. Oh, Lord. See, the problem with most of us is we want the greatest investment, we want the greatest return with the least amount of investment. We want the greatest return with the least amount of investment. That's why folk get in lottery lines. Because they want the greatest return with the least amount of investment. How do you want to be anointed and you don't want to pray? Amen. Can, I, can I work right here? How you call yourself a prophet or a prophetess and all you do is run your mouth? Yes, the prophetic is a, is a speaking gift, but more than we speak, we got to hear and pray. No, prophet, shut your mouth. About 85% of what God speaks to us as prophets, we have to carry it in the chamber and not bring it out of the chamber. See, that's the problem. We got too many immature people trying to carry the weight and the weight of the prophetic. You can't carry it if you don't know how to shut your mouth and pray. You can't tell everything you hear in the spirit. Write it down, take it to the chamber, and pray it through. Amen. That's not just for the prophets. That's for all y'all around here trying to get in the parking lot and tell folk what God said. Amen. Just because you see it doesn't mean you're supposed to say it. Because if you're not careful and you have not been with, oh, I'm sorry, that's the apostolic coming out of me tonight. But what happens is you can, if you're not mature enough to carry this thing, you can give a word out of timing. And if you mess around and give a word out of timing, you'll have people chasing stuff that they're not ready to handle. Yeah. Amen. They'll be chasing stuff that they're not ready to handle. Timing is everything in the kingdom. So if you're not mature enough, you better learn how to submit well enough. Don't try to be so spiritual that you can't submit that word to your leaders and say, here, I, I have a word that I feel like God's given me. And let them develop you and train you so you can be an accurate prophet. And I have an accurate word even if you're not a prophet, but you can deliver it in the right timing. And don't get mad with your leaders if they tell you now is not the time. They don't like me, but it's all right. And so, let me hurry. So, so you have to be careful. All these words you're trying to give, shut your mouth. Just because you had a dream, shut your mouth. Don't tell everybody what you see. If God gave you the dream, it could be for you to pray about. Amen. If God gave you the vision, it could be because he wants you to pray about it. Not because he wants your whole, all your prayer partners on it. I'm sorry. Okay, let me, let me. But if it's going to happen, whenever God speaks, there's an if. And you got to be willing to obey in the if, or you will not see the fullness of what God has said. And there has to be an investment in what you're expecting. If you don't have a prayer life, you're not investing. If you don't know how to worship, I can tell when folks know how to worship and when they don't. don't talk long. I'm not talking about when you're tired in your body. Sometimes you might be tired when you come to church. And sometimes you may sit there, but at least your hands will go up if you got a real worship. If you got a real worship, at least your tongue's going to move on you if you got a real worship. Not because the music is playing, but because there's something playing down in your belly that you can't help but give him a worship. And I come to tell you.
you tonight. If you don't do it at home, I know I know why you don't do it in church. Lord, I feel like preaching. I said, if you don't do it at home, I know why you don't do it in church. When you got more praying at night, when you got oh Lord, when you got more meat meal, when you got more. When they outweigh uh, the, the, the songs of the Lord on your ring, I'm not saying you gotta listen to gospel all the time, but ladies and gentlemen, there's, if, if that stuff outweighs your time of worship, things are off balance in your life. I can't hear nobody. Come on, come on, come on. If it outweighs your worship, there's a problem. There's a problem. If you ain't never been in your car and had to pull over once or twice, I remember I was on my way to Atlanta one day and I started thinking about the goodness of God. I had to get off the exit and pull over to the side and I know this folk thought I was crazy because I went around to the other side of the car so I didn't look so bad and I just started picking them up and putting them down right there. If you've never had a when I think moment, I question what you've been up to. Because I don't need, I don't need prophets here getting up here to tell me what to do in a worship service. Because all I got to do is think about how good God has been. This I told my church the other night. I said, even if you don't know the song the praise he was singing, if a dog walked down the aisle and the dog started barking and said, God is good, well, I'm real, real. you are on this talking. Somebody, you gotta put action to your ear. You gotta put action to your ear. You gotta put action to your ear. And so, Bible says in verse number twelve that Isaac sowed in that land, and when he sowed in that land, he reaped a hundredfold in the same year. God have mercy. And here's what messed me up because after Isaac reaped a hundredfold in the same year, they looked at Isaac and got mad, and King Abimelech said, "Get out." I need, I, need, I need to work right here. Come on. Uh. Need to work. Cut. God, you just told me stay here. You told me earlier this year, stay here. Now Abimelech is telling me, get gone. God, you told me All right. here. Yes. But now, I'm being pushed out of my here. Come on. Uh -huh. Somebody in here right now, you feel yourself being pushed out of your here. And you don't understand why you're being pushed out of your here. But I promise if you hang with me a few more minutes, you're going to know why you're getting pushed out of your here. God. Right, listen, let's go ahead and just jump the gun and say, the reason why I'm getting pushed out of my here. I'm not saying that. I said the reason why I'm not I'm getting pushed out of my here because God is getting ready to push me to my back. It intimidated Abimelech. It intimidated Abimelech. Listen, I don't know who this is for, but God's getting ready to bless you on such a level. It's about to intimidate some folks. Yes. That should have been about four or five folks that holler back at me right there. I said, God's getting ready to bless you on such a level. It's getting ready to intimidate some folks. Folks that have had ministries longer than y'all are getting ready to be intimidated. Don't mess with me yet. Folks that have ministries that's longer than y'all are getting ready to be intimidated by the stuff that your are is about to do. Yeah. 
got a problem. We got a real big problem. Because here he is. He's been expanded. He's been enlarged. He's, called, he's been caused to progress. And now he's pushed out. Come on. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Did you see the picture? He gets pushed out, but now he's got more stuff. Which means the weight that he's got to carry is heavier than it ever was before. Somebody in here, you're wondering what God has been doing. He said the weight has been heavier for a reason. I enlarged you and I expanded you. And now I got to push you to a place where you trust me. He enlarged you. Man, here in this place, he enlarged you. He blessed you. He caused you to prosper. Things were going good. You had more stuff. But then, all of a sudden, you got put you were on that good job with benefits. And all of a sudden, things got turned upside down. And you're saying, God, what am I supposed to do with this situation? Because here I am. I've been serving you. I've been obeying you. And you caused me to prosper. You showed everybody that you were with me. And now it looks like you're not with me anymore. Because now you push me out. And I've been pushed out into a place that I don't understand. Yeah. Uh, what you had to leave behind. 
when you are required to leave some stuff behind. There are some friends you're going to have to leave behind. There's some jobs you're going to have to leave behind. There's some stuff you're going to have to leave behind. And if you are so attached to those things, you will miss the opportunity to start digging again. But tell somebody else, take dig another well. Dig another well. Dig another well.
Thank y'all for letting me preach like I'm feeling tonight. Good God, Mike. He didn't fight. You know what he did? He moved on. Come on, come on. Moving on is an art. It's an art. There is an art to moving on. I'm not going to let you. Come on. Let me, let me, let me say it like I always say. Your storm is no longer going to invade my peace. Somebody 
going to hate on you. Stop tripping. It's supposed to happen. It's supposed to happen. No. You are not ready with your promotion until you can be okay with being hated. Come on. Amen. Come on. Amen. Dominion life, y'all ain't ready for promotion until they're hating on y'all real good. Amen. <laughs> but if they can hate on you, yes. Yes. And you can still stand the test and love. Watch, watch this. Wow. Not just keep doing what you do. Yes. I say stand the test and love them yes. in spite of the hell yes. they put you through. Yes. Amen. See, that's where we miss it. I gotta talk the Bible. The Bible says love your enemies. We don't do too well with that. Because you talk about me, I ain't fooling up with you. Come on, that's what we say, isn't it? Come on. You treat me bad, I'm not fooling up with you. But when we got the love of Christ operating down there, if you see it broken down on the side of the road, you don't ride past it and let them stay broken down. You pull your car over and you say, what can I do to help you? You know they talked about you. You know they called you out. You know they said some ugly stuff about you. But you still do what you can to bless them. Because watch this. God is not looking at them. He's looking at you. That's right. That's right. Your blessing is not on them, your blessing is contingent upon you. How will you handle the hate? So the Bible says, verse 22, I'm almost there, y'all. The Bible says in verse 22 that he moves again. He doesn't y'all have this. Because sitting literally in the Hebrew was a, a derivative of the word Satan. As we know, it meant hatred. <laughs> It represented ongoing conflict. Anybody been in that place in your life? Or you're there right now? Okay, let me clear it up for you. If it ain't one thing. <laughs> Anybody? Yeah, all right. If it ain't one thing, it's another. Yeah. By the time you get things right in your body, then something breaks down in your family, in your house. By the time something breaks down in your house, you get that fixed in your car. Well, that's the right. If it ain't one thing. It's Lord have mercy. But then, uh, let me say something right here. Y'all gotta get this. Uh, because it was important. See, after the, after the first two wells didn't work out, it would be our inclination to say, I'm done. Come on. Right. right. I'm trying to preach the pastors too. Right. I'm trying to preach to y'all too. See, the first inclination when things don't work out is, I'm done. But when we're in this thing, you got to understand that if you don't, if you don't keep going, if you don't dig another well, everything attached to you dies if you don't keep digging. All right, amen. All right. All right. Men in the house, people that leave families in this house. If you're a single mama, if you don't keep digging, everything attached to you is going to die. All right, come on. I, that's a hard word. Come on. That's a hard work. Could it be the reason why your marriage is on the brink? It's because you quit digging? Could it be that the reason why your children are still strung out is because you quit digging? All right. Come on. Now, I'm not saying it's always your fault, but sometimes the reason why things are happening is because we got to keep moving, we got to keep digging. If you don't dig another well, everything attached to you is going to die. I don't know who I'm talking to in here tonight, but God has given me a word to tell you, dig another well. Come on. Let me hurry. Scholars say that when he moved this time, this third time, he moved and it said it was about 40 miles which was a long journey for them if they were walking or they were on a beast. It was about 40 miles. And so they, he traveled and he went to a place. I'm trying to hurry, y'all. Just walk with me for a few more minutes. Uh, he, he, he went to a place and he dug another well. Somebody say another well. Another well. This third well sprung up and nobody was fighting him. This third well sprung up and everything was good. And so the Bible declared that he spoke up and he said, this is Rehoboth. Lord have mercy. Somebody ought to praise God for your Rehoboth. In case you don't understand what Rehoboth means, it means the Lord has made room for you. Oh, somebody somewhere, I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but there's a job that's out there waiting on you. They created the position so that you can be the one that steps right into it because God is making room for the Lord. The position wasn't there before, but it's going to be there now because God is making
says, hear me. He didn't just say God made Rome. He didn't just say God made Rome. He says, but we're going to be fruitful here. All right. Come on. Come on. Two different things. I'm not just going to have room when I'm about to be fruitful. Here. 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 I'm not just going to be having room when I'm going to be fruitful. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. Somebody ought to celebrate that yeah, God yeah. didn't just make a room, but he also put you in a place. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. In the middle of a famine, God did it. He said he put enough, watch this, you were in a famine when you were back in Jarrah, and yet God blessed you a hundredfold while you were back in Jarrah, and it produced enough faith in you that when you got to Rehoboth, you were still in a famine, but God was going to make you fruitful. the fact that God lets you go through everything you went through because it trained your faith for this place right here. Everything you struggled with, it trained your faith for this place right here. You are a faith in right now. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, God. Stay on stand back when I feel good and holler. Coming up right about here. Now, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, most preachers, <clears throat> when they get to this place called Rehoboth, give me a little base of this money. When they get to Rehoboth, that's where they hang the hat, apostle. Preachers hang their hat at Rehoboth because Rehoboth is the place where God made room. That's where most of us shout because God made room. And I'm going to be fruitful here. But I went ahead and read it on to the next verse because it said now that Isaac was in a fruitful place. He was in a large place. It said, but Isaac decided, I'm going up. Come on here. I decided. Oh, yeah. I decided. He said, I'm going to a place called Beersheba. Y'all can get me in a second. Because I'm going to a place called Beersheba. Now, now what you got to understand is this. Is that Beersheba was not in the valley. In other words, Isaac said, I've been here long enough. And, oh, Lord, he said, in essence, we're holding ain't it. I need somebody to holler, we're holding just because I'm in a large place, just because I'm in a blessed place, I'm not stopping here. Because this place is still too low for me. Lord, have mercy. I need a church to help me here. This place is still too low for me. Well, if you get a place that's too low for you, what you gonna do? I'm gonna go high. Yeah. It never said that God told Isaac to go up. But now watch this. The first two places that Isaac went, he went there, he was pushed there because of his pain. Feel like preaching now, y'all. He was pushed in the first two places because of rejection. He was pushed in the first two places because they didn't like him. He was pushed in the first two places because they couldn't stand him. He was pushed because of his pain. Somebody ought to follow in here and say my pain.
what they did to you yesterday. Oh, yeah. 